Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India So what we will um, start from today and this is what we will end with, I mean the course is uh, some spectroscopic tools. You know what is spectroscopy, a little bit of that and absorption, fluorescence, IR, CD, okay. So that is why this class starts uh, with this uh, heading experimental tools, that means the tools you would need. These are not the techniques, these are the tools you would need to probe the folding and unfolding of proteins. But remember these tools are very general because we are talking about, because this is a course on biophysical chemistry our focus is mainly on proteins or biomacromolecules or biomolecules. But as such you take any, you take any other compound or molecule which is not a biomolecule still these tools would be equally applicable, right. So that is you know that is the real good thing about the generality of this uh, thing or this subject called spectroscopy. So this you have seen before but I will just uh, quickly uh, scan through it. So some of these experimental techniques one is fluorescence, look at the relevant time scale you can go from nanoseconds to seconds right and what do you get out from it. So if fluorescence is as says under intrinsic, intrinsic means something which is present in the protein itself. So some of the intrinsic amino acids are tryptophan, tyrosine, also phenylalanine, but trypt and tyrosine are the ones which are mainly used in the fluorescence emission of. Then ANS, I told you before that ANS is a certain dye called 1 alanine 8 naphthalene sulfonic acid. Now this dye is commonly used to look at exposure of hydrophobic patches in proteins, okay. So you can also look at the change in fluorescence intensity of ANS to figure out what is going on as you change conditions. Then third is uh, FRET, you know we have talked about this a little bit, FRET is about how the transfer of energy occurs between a donor and acceptor and this depends upon the distance between these two, right. So you can understand if you are looking at a conformational transition, you start from an unfolded state and you come to a folded state and you have two chromophores this donor acceptor, what will happen is in unfolded state they would be really far off. So fluorescence or rather energy transfer efficiency would be really low. When they come very close to each other the energy transfer efficiency would be really high and that is how you can track it and you can even use it for kinetics, right. And then there is uh, something known as anisotropy, if you remember uh, this thing we had done uh, this uh, protein apomyoglobin, did you remember? Uh, apomyoglobin when we were talking about this um, ribosomal tunnel and we said that apomyoglobin starts getting some structure and there was something known as rotational correlation time or rotational spectroscopy where you would look at the rotation of uh, apomyoglobin fragment and see whether it is bound to the uh, peptide tunnel or not. So that is essentially what it is an isotropy. So, so these are some of the main techniques that fall under fluorescence. Then a very important technique called circular dichroism. So for example if you would get if you would get a protein right if you get a protein and the first thing someone asks you does it have a structure. If it does have a structure what structure does it have I am talking about the secondary structure. So then immediately what you can do is you can take the sample, put it in the CD spectrometer and take our accurate spectrum, right. And that will, that is one of the easiest ways of finding out whether a protein has an alpha helical structure or a beta sheet structure or a mixed type, you know you can do fittings and all these things. Not only the secondary structure, you can also look at the tertiary structure. So that is why you will see there are two regions, wavelength regions, one is the far UV and one is the near UV. So what is this far and near about? Near Near, near and far is with respect to what? Why do we call near? Why do we call far? Which what wavelength? Visible, right? So if anything is near UV, that means this is in the UV region, but near to the visible 
So, where, so visible say is from say 400 to 700 nanometers, right? So anything which is close to 400 would be near UV because it's near to the visible region. The more you, the farther you move lower from 400, you go to the far UV. So typically for CD, the far UV looks at secondary structure. That's what it says. You can see the far UV secondary structure. So that is alpha helix, beta sheet, and all these things, right? Even random coil. The near UV looks at the tertiary structure. Okay, so there will also be tertiary structure, uh, structural changes which happen in the near UV region. So near UV region would, as you can see, 350, 400, and all these things. Okay. So then there is something known as small angle X-ray scattering. So small angle X-ray scattering, popularly known as SAXS. Now what does it tell you? It gives you the dimension and the shape of the polypeptide chain. Now this is what you need it for. Say for example. Suppose you are unfolding a protein, right? That means you are destroying the structure in a protein. It goes from folded to a uh, native to a non native or denatured state. Now, someone asks you, what is the change in the dimension? Now, you know that if you are going to open a protein, now the dimension is going to change because you are disrupting forces and the protein is now slowly opening up. Now, all proteins would not open up exactly the same manner. Some proteins might undergo a huge change in dimension, some proteins might not be undergoing that much of a change in dimension. But how would you know what is happening? So one of the techniques is small angle excess scattering, which tells you, which tells you, or gives an idea about the approximate dimension of your protein state, whether it's uh, in the unfolded or whether it's in the folded. And remember, whenever you're talking about this SA excess, you're doing in solution, so you always look at what you do not. You always essentially look at the hydronaivic radius, right? Because you always have water molecules associated with these things. Okay. The next one is uh, FTIR. It's called Fourier transform infrared. Now I know that in uh, one of your physical chemistry practicals, you have done this infrared spectroscopy. What was that experiment? Was it this? Uh, was it? Was, wasn't it a dimer formation or something like that? You did. It was in your first uh, practical. You used the uh, IR instrument, right, in an instrumentation lab. So that's uh, the principle. Proteins have. Uh, remember, we were talk when we were talking about the laser-induced temperature jump. We talked about this uh, IR absorption band. 1631 for an alpha helix. So this is essentially what you're talking about. So if you take FTIR, then you would be getting that information of your secondary structure as well. Now, what is the time scale for this? The time scale is nanoseconds to seconds. So then the other one is something which you know very well. It is called absorbance. This is essentially Lambert Beer's law, right? UV absorbance in the UV visible region. FTIR was absorbance in the what? IR region because you are looking at bond stretching, bond vibration. This is your electronic transition you are looking at absorbance in the near UV. So it is nanoseconds to second, that is the time scale, it can even actually even go lower. What essentially look, look at is aromatic residues or cofactors. Okay? So for example, cofactor, how do we define a cofactor? Well, let us take this myoglobin right? or hemoglobin. Hemoglobin has what? There is a heme prosthetic group in the middle. So this one has a characteristic transition. Do you know what the transition is known as? But that band is known as pi to uh, yes, pi to pi to transition. What is a band known as? It starts with an S. It is called a Sorer band. Right? So, the Sorer band is something which you can look at the absorbance of and see what changes are going on at the at some stru structural level. right? Then, obviously, of NMR, there are two types one is real time, one is dynamic. So, you can look at the you know the breadth of time scale in one case it is millisecond to second in the other case it's about 200 microseconds or so okay so you know that's pretty much about the common tools or the tools that are used commonly when people are looking at proteins or investigating proteins no matter for what reason right but before we go into spectroscopy we have to know some very basic things right so let's look at this the first basic thing obviously is if you are interested in spectroscopy I do not know how much was covered in group theory and spectroscopy in your class, but that was mostly from the group theory point of view. But if you would be ever interested in spectroscopy, if you are interested in spectroscopy, you want to take spectroscopy up as your you know future uh, PhD project or whatever, then please do look up time dependent perturbation theory if you are not taught okay, at any subsequent time of this. So time dependent perturbation theory we cannot go over in this class because it would take some time and we do not have uh, much time left. So time dependent perturbation theory is the thing which from where, where, from where essentially spectroscopy originates. Remember perturbation is a certain perturbation. What do you are, in this case, if you are doing spectroscopy, what are you perturbing the system with? You are perturbing the system with the electromagnetic field which is a radiation and that is why that comes into your perturbation. 
Okay, it's like h0 plus lambda h prime. Do you remember? That was your perturbation theory. That h prime is an oscillating uh, function of your, I mean, it's a essentially a radiation, okay, oscillation function of time. So please look that up. So that's uh, extremely essential. But what we'll do is, uh, we will consider the fact that, okay, time dependent perturbation theory is there. We have to look that up. We'll move forward and we'll talk about something which is very fundamental. This is referred to as. Einstein's coefficients. So, if it was Einstein's coefficients, okay. Now, let us consider this two level system, okay. So, two level means I have a two level system that means this is my ground state, G stands for ground and this is my excited state, E stands for excited. Okay. Now, what I will do is, I will throw in some radiation that is some energy density. The system, whatever system I am looking at would absorb that and then move from the ground state to the excited state. So, the first process is absorption. Okay? So, the first process is absorption so this is absorption okay? so here after you have excited the molecule from the ground state to the excited state what will happen? The molecule cannot stay at the excited state for infinite time. What it would try to do is it would try to come down to the ground state. Now, okay, it can come down to the ground state in two ways. What I mean by two ways? One is it can just spontaneously by itself come down, right? Spontaneously by itself come down. That means let me give you a wiggly line. So, this is referred to as. A spontaneous downward transition, okay, from the excited state to the ground state, okay. The other one is, if one is spontaneous, what is the other way of coming down? Can you tell me? Yeah, what does it give rise to? That's what happens in lasers, right? What is the full form of laser? Right. So, if this is spontaneous, if this is spontaneous, then what is the other form? Yes. If it is spontaneous, the other one is non spontaneous, right? Very good. But you just said, Pancham, what is that? Light amplification by stimulated, stimulated emission. emission. That means, okay, good. Understood. <laughs> so, if one is spontaneous, that means it just comes down by itself, it does not have to be told to come down to the ground state. The other one, is stimulated that means there is something which stimulates its, tra its transition from the upper level which is the excited state to the ground state right so then this is the other one we have so this is your stimulated emission okay this stimulated one is a spontaneous transition one is a stimulated transition now, stimulated emission of radiation as I just pointed out is the principle of laser, right? Light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, right? But remember, these are three distinct processes, okay? But also try to realize one thing. When you are when you are coming down, you can have two types of transitions, right? Spontaneous and stimulated. But when you are going to have an absorption, are you going to have any spontaneous absorption? You are not going to have a spontaneous absorption. Why? Because for absorption you need to supply energy, right? And only after it absorbs the energy would it go to the excited state there is no way you can just go like that right it, it, it just cannot it just cannot happen that it was sitting on it on its chair one fine day and then suddenly it jumps to the excited state it cannot do that it has to be hit with a certain electromagnetic radiation which it would absorb right okay so that's why there are three exclusive processes okay in, in very general terms now what i can do is i can say that okay let us try to write some equations down. How do we do that? What I say is, 
based on this, I say that my rate of transition, my rate of transition from the ground state to the excited state, where 1 refers to the ground state and 2 refers to the excited state. Okay. So, that means 1 is the ground state and 2 is the excited state. Okay. So, this is equal to that means, I am looking at the rate of transition where well, w 1 2 is the rate of transition from the ground state to the excited state. It would depend upon what? Now, think about a rate in your chemical reaction. What does it depend upon? It depends upon rate constant, it depends upon a concentration very good. So, now in this case instead of concentration what we will use is the number of molecules n 1 2. Okay. Then I will use a rate constant which I write as b 1 2, the rate constant which I write as b 1 2. But please remember this, please remember this, I am not yet done. Why? Because absorption cannot occur spontaneously, right. What would it depend upon? It would depend upon the energy I am supplying it with, the electromagnetic field, right. So, what we say is we take this and we multiply it as a term which is rho nu. So, this is the energy density with which you are hitting your molecule that is finally absorbing the energy you are hitting it with. Okay. Now, rho nu, rho nu is your energy density that is energy per unit volume over a or per unit frequency interval or over a defined frequency range. Where have you seen this before rho nu? You have seen this before. Tell me where. What was the first thing you did in quantum mechanics before you actually went on to the postulates? Yes, you did that. You did black body radiation. Remember in black body radiation there was something known as rho nu, where rho nu d nu was equal to this times uh, by over this times d nu, where you had this uh, you know Planck's expressions coming in. So, rho nu essentially is this, this is exactly the same rho nu, it is your energy density. Okay. It is your energy density over a defined frequency interval or per unit frequency interval. So, rho nu is your energy density So, that means, that means what is your assumption? Your assumption is that means you are treating this whole process, the tre treating this whole process as the molecule being a what? Black body emitter or absorber. Okay. That means, your molecule is being treated as a black body system. That is what you are using it. It does not matter because you know what the energy density is, you know the distribution. That is what you are using it for. Right. So, this is equation number 1. Now, remember this was for the upgoing process right? that is from 1 to 2. So, I should also have one rate equation which comes down the other way. right? So, that means, if this is from the ground to the excited state that means, I am looking at an absorption process. What would happen if I want to come down that is w 2 1 that is the rate of coming down to the ground state from the excited state that is from 2 to 1. This is equal to how many factors, how many terms would I be having here now? How many independent terms? In the first case equation 1 I had only one term right which was n times b times rho nu. In the second case how many would I be having tell me? 2, I will be having 2 why? Because I have 2 processes one is a stimulated one is a spontaneous right. So, the stimulated please understand would just be the reverse of absorption. So, in this case what I would write is n 2 1 that is the number of molecules in the excited state which is 2 times b 2 1 that is the rate constant of this downward transition. Remember I am talking about stimulated and because this is stimulated what what extra should come along with, with it? energy density right because absorption was also stimulated in the sense right you had to do that absorption. So, again you will be having the same rho nu 
Okay, so this is your stimulated. Lifetime is also coming. Lifetime is coming. Lifetime will be coming from here, but lifetime is a result of that. Lifetime, this you will get the lifetime. Hold on, right? Lifetime will come from here because we're talking about rates, right? And what is lifetime? Lifetime is the time it takes to decay, right? So once we get the rate constant, we'll get the lifetime too. Simple, okay? Then the next term, the next term has to be of your or for your spontaneous. So it would be n21. Now I define a new constant. New constant is a21. Okay, n21 times a21, where a is a rate constant for what? Spontaneous transition or spontaneous emission down to the ground state. Now tell me, along with this, should I write rho nu or not? I would not write rho nu, right? Because this is not stimulated. This is spontaneous, right? So that's why then this is your total expression for the rate of downward transition, and this is two. Okay. Now let's go to the next step. So what we have seen is we have two different equations. In one case we have just one way of going up. In the other case we have two very general ways of coming down, right? One is a spontaneous, one is stimulated, right? One in which you do not have to hit, the other one which you have to Sti stimulate, peg along to move down. So suppose this happens. Suppose I say that there is no stimulating radiation. Suppose there is no stimulating radiation. That means it has absorbed, but for it to come back, it does not get any stimulated radiation. That means for from 2 to 1, your rho nu is essentially what? 0. Okay. If that is the case, if that is the case, remember you have to have radiation for absorption to occur, right? Otherwise, it will not go up. But what I am saying now is once it goes up, everything comes down by spontaneous emission, there is no stimulated emission. So then what I can write is if this is the case, what I can say then d n 2 1 over d of t, d n 2 1 over d of t should be equal to, should be equal to, now what should I write now here? What should I write? Minus n 2 1 times a 2 1, that is what you do, right? Rate constant times concentration, the same here is rate constant A times the constant, the number of molecules. So this is 3. So now what you can do is you can integrate this, you can integrate this. So you will be having d of n 2 1 over n 2 1 is equal to minus a 2 1 d of t and then you carry out the integration. Okay? Then you carry out the integration, it is very simple. So what you will be getting is this, right? so this is essentially what type of process, is, isn't, it your correct, isn't it your characteristic first order process you are looking at. So then what will happen is you can write n to 1 t is equal to n to 1 0 that means at 0 time e to the power minus a to 1 times t. Okay. That means at t is equal to 0 the number of molecules is n to 1 0 and then you are looking at its decay as a function of time and it is an exponentially decaying function. right? So let this be 4. Okay. Now a to 1. What was a to 1? a to 1 was a rate constant, was not it? So I can write this one again as n to 1 of t is equal to n to 1 0 e to the power minus t by tau to 1. So now you can understand Pancham where your lifetime is coming, this is where it is coming, right? Okay. Do you know what this lifetime is known as? or this tau, what is it known as? See we had encountered this tau before, that was the relaxation time and all these things before, right? But what is this tau known as? This tau, I will tell you what, this tau is known as radiative lifetime. Okay? This tau is known as radiative lifetime 
that is why it is also referred to as tau radiative and I can write tau radiative is equal to 1 by a 2 1. This is number 6. Okay. Now, this is a very important equation where a is where a is a 2 1 is a rate constant for spontaneous emission from 2 to 1 that is from state 2 or level 2 to level 1. Okay. So, this why again this tau is called the radiative lifetime and it is tau radiation and this is actually the inverse of your rate constant for spontaneous emission. Okay. Good. Now, think about this. This is where we had considered there was no stimulating radiation to start with. Now, what happens if you have both? That means, you also have spontaneous radiation occurring. You also have stimulant radiation occurring. That means, if both spontaneous and stimulated radiation occur, then at equilibrium then at equilibrium that means, my equilibrium has been attained. If the equilibrium ha has been attained then what will happen? The rate of upward transi transition would be equal to the rate of downward transition right and then I can write w 1 2 is equal to w 2 1 is not it. I can write w 1 2 is equal to w 2 1. Okay. So, from here from here then I can again write n 1 2 b 1 2 rho nu is equal to n 2 1 b 2 1 rho nu plus n 2 1 a 2 1. So, I have just put in the expressions for w 1 2 and w 2 1 that is what we had written before. Okay. What am I solving for? what I am solving for is rho nu that means, from here you find the expression for rho nu. So, then from here I can write rho nu n 1 2 b 1 2 minus n 2 1 b 2 1 is equal to n 2 1 a 2 1 or rho nu is equal to n 2 1 times a 2 1 over n 1 2 b 1 2 minus n 2 1 b 2 1 and let this be equation number 9. Okay. Let this be equation number 9. Okay. Now, please remember the assumption we had started with was rho nu is that of a black body rho nu is that of a black body. Okay. If rho nu is that of a black body then what we can now do is we already have an expression for rho nu from Planck's hypothesis. So, we just use that expression for rho nu if and if you remember that if you would remember that from before rho nu is equal to 8 pi nu cube sorry h nu cube over c cube times 1 over e to the power h nu over k t minus 1. This is what you know from before. So, essentially what you are trying to do is you have this rate constants b 2 1 and a 2 1 right. You have this rate constants b 2 1 and a 2 1. 
We have started with these, but we do not know what A21 and B21 are. We have to get expressions for these in terms of certain parameters we know, like say a Planck's constant, like a frequency, which is something we very inherent when we are talking about spectroscopy, right. So, can we make a comparison between this one and the one we had already derived, which was equation number 9, okay. But before going there, before going there, another assumption we will take is we assume that Boltzmann's distribution is maintained. So, we assume that Boltzmann's distribution is maintained. Okay. And if that is the case, if that is the case, then I can write n 2 over n 1 is equal to e to the power minus h nu over k t e to the power minus h nu over k t. Here, I am sure you have seen this, I can also write g 2 over g 1. Can you tell what g refers, refers to? What does g refer to? Degeneracy. degeneracy, right. So, g refers to degeneracy. So, what this g 2 and g 1, they take care of the fact how many same energy levels you have of that specific level we are talking about, right. So, then from here I can write g is a respective degeneracy right and where 11 came from please remember where 11 came from it came from if you would remember if ever you would be doing this Boltzmann population n 2 over n 1 it would be e to the power minus h or e to the minus e 2 minus e 1 over k t remember. So, that is e 2 minus e 1 is what? So, delta e which is equal to h nu and that is what you are looking at. Okay. So, that is what your Boltzmann population is, right. So, that was number 11, right. Now, going back, so from equation 9, okay. let us go back to equation 9. From equation 9, what I can write is rho nu is equal to, rho nu is equal to, now I will do two small algebraic things. One is I will divide, divide throughout that is the numerator and the denominator by n 2 1. Okay. I will divide throughout by n 2 1. So, what I can do is I can write a 2 1 by n 1 2 n 2 1 times b 1 2 minus n 2 1 will be cancelled actually minus b 2 1. This is number 12. So, I am dividing throughout by n 2 1. Okay. Now, the next step, the next step is see I have to somehow get rid of the n's. Okay. I have to somehow get rid of the n's. One n I have already get rid of, gotten rid of in terms uh, in front of b 2 1 that was I divided throughout by n 2 1. Now, what can I substitute in, uh, in place of n 1 2 over n 2 1? What can I do? Right, we just did that, right? So here, n one two over n two one is essentially n one over n two, because n one two is the number of molecules in the ground state going to the excited state, and n two one is the number of molecules in the excited state coming down to the ground state. Okay, so then we do that. So this is rho nu is equal to a two one over. So here, if n 2 by n 1 was g 2 by g 1 e to the minus h nu over k t, what would this be? g 1 by g 2 then e to the power h nu over k t, right. Then I will be having b 1 2 minus b 2 1, right. That is b 13. Okay. So, here, so what I have done is we have used 11 in 12 
to get 13. Okay. Now, tell me you look at number 10 by yourself and look at equation number 13. What extra thing do we need to do to get a fair comparison between these two equations? So, look at the last factor of equation number 10. What is the last factor? 1 over e to the power h nu by kt minus 1. Okay. So, that means since it is minus 1, I should be I need I should need to get rid of b21 by putting a 1 out there. So, what do I do? I divide throughout by what? b21. Okay. So, that means dividing 13 by b21 we get rho nu is equal to a21 over b21 because I have divided by b21 times 1 by times 1 by what should I be having here now I should be having b12 over b21 right then g1 g2 e to the power h nu by k t minus 1 this is equation number 14 for me see is this okay I have just put in 1 by dividing throughout by b21 okay now now what you do is compare 14 and 10 compare 14 and 10 if you compare 14 and 10 if you compare 14 and 10 what would you have so for example in 14 or 10 has two factors the first factor is 8 pi h nu cube over c cube which should be equal to what a21 over b21 the next factor is for 10 is 1 by e to the power h nu by kt minus 1 okay we already have minus 1 we already have e to the power h nu by kt but what is the coefficient in terms of e to the power h nu by kt 1 so then comparing this what can i write so i can write so comparing 14 and 10 the first thing is b12 by b21 g1 over g2 should be equal to 1 or I can write g1 b21 is equal to g2 b12 that is one equation for me this will be number 15. Now, let us look at the much the other fundamental one the other fund huh? where g1 into b12 why it was g1 by g2 right tell me if i'm wrong it's g1 into b21 isn't it or no why no b12 over b21 times g1 over g2 is equal to 1 isn't it so then b12 times g2 ah right kya bol rahe ho my bad chalo b12 times g1 is equal to g2 times b21 this is what you're saying right b12 times g1 is equal to g2 times b21 right okay so that's one then the next thing is this from the further comparison we have a21 by what was the other one by b21 is equal to 8 pi h nu cubed over c cubed this this is a new cubed over c cube let me write it again a21 over b21 is equal to 8 pi h nu cubed over c cubed okay this would be 16 okay now look at the importance of this here what you are looking at is the ratio of two rate constants a is the spontaneous rate constant b is the 
stimulated one. 8 pi h over c cube is a constant, everything is constant. What is the variable? Nu cube. That means the higher is your nu, the higher is your nu, which one would be more spontaneous or stimulated? The higher is your nu, the more would be your spontaneous transition, right? So that means higher nu leads to more spontaneous transition. Okay. Now, pause a little bit and think about this. Lasers, it is light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. I have to have stimulated emission. What is the competing process along with, what is the competing process with stimulated emission? Spontaneous emission, right. I would not, I would not like to have too much of spontaneous emission when I am talking about lasers. I will tell you why, okay. try to understand this. In lasers, see if you are stimulating something, that means if you, if you have a certain electromagnetic field with a certain phase coming in and that radiation is stimulating the downward transition of a molecule from the excited to the ground state. What will happen is, the way, when it will interact, it will keep the same phase information. Okay, the phase information would be the same, right? This leads, leads to something known as coherence. Coherence in light. So, what is what do you mean by coherence? Coherence means everything kind of is moving along in the same direction, maintaining the same phase relationship. Because if they move out of phase, what will happen? They would destructively interfere with each other. So that means you will always have to maintain the same phase. Okay, that's where it comes from. To give you a very simple example, a real life. If you would ever see soldiers marching on a bridge, you would see they always lift the legs together in coherence, that is in coherence. That means they are not running out of phase and it really looks beautiful when they do the drill because each and every one is marching simultaneously, synchronously actually that is the word by lifting that respective le uh, leg or bringing the other respective leg down simultaneously. So, if one is lift lifting the right leg, everyone else lifts the right leg, that is a coherence. That means if you are hitting if you are hitting uh, sti or stimulating radiation at a certain phase, certain phase, then the ones which it stimulates to come down will also be coming out in the same phase. Now, this gives us to something known as coherence, which it is called a coherent property of light. But think about spontaneous. In spontaneous, there is no nothing, right? In spontaneous, because it is spontaneous nothing, the photons or the molecules can come down in any way maintaining any phase relationship that means the light coming out can have any phase relationship. So, that is called non coherent radiation. Lasers is always about coherent radiance because you need a very focused light with high intensity beam, right. So, laser radiation is always coherent, right. So, that means to have a coherent laser radiation I would have to have the least amount of spontaneous radiation possible and the highest amount of stimulated radiation possible, okay. Now, you look this up and you come back and tell me, but I will give you something to think about. It is very hard, it is very hard to find lasers in the blue, especially in the UV. Can you tell me why? Right. So, think about this. Whatever lasers you see, whatever lasers you see, you know there are diode lasers and all these things nowadays, it would be mostly like 400 up and so. The moment you come to the UV, what will happen is the nu is very high. Now, because the nu is very high, what is happening? The ratio is increasing, that is, the spontaneous emission is becoming more. If the spontaneous emission is becoming more, then the efficiency of the laser is going down like anything. That is why it is very hard to get lasers in the blue in the UV. And if you are going to get one, it becomes really expensive just because of this simple principle, remember, because this is a fundamental nature of your light, you cannot do anything with it. The only thing you can do is devise some method to counter it, but there is no other way you can do it because this is what you have just derived without any principle, right? We are just based on equilibrium. So, please remember this. The amount of stimulated or the amount of spontaneous emission you have or the ratio of the stimulated and spontaneous emission is governed by the new cube. That is why you go higher up, you go visible and all these things where the new becomes lower and lower 
what will happen is you will see more and more lasers coming up. Okay, that's typically why it is. Again, take it from me, this is a very fundamental thing you ought to know. It's a very fundamental thing. And that's why Einstein's A and B coefficients are so important in spectroscopy, absorption and fluorescence. Right? Einstein's A and B coefficients, especially the ratio of A over B, because it tells you exactly in which region you are not going to get a very efficient laser system, because your stimulated emission is going to decrease drastically. Rather, your spontaneous emission increases like anything. Okay? Will you keep that in mind? Good. So, so then these Einstein's A and B coefficients has, have uh, also other meanings. I will come to those uh, when we deal with those things later, as and when we deal with those things. Right? Now, before ending this class, I will just introduce something with which I can carry on in the next class. So, let us go back to the slides. Let us talk about a transition. Okay. Let us talk about transition. Now, what do you see here? What do you see here? So, on the y axis you have energy, potential energy. On the x axis you have r. What is r? No. Reaction corner, it is not the reaction coordinate here. Well, it is a reaction corner, but it is a bond distance, it is an internuclear distance, right. Where have you seen this before? What feature of quantum mechanics does this come across? Frank Condor principle, excellent. It comes across in Frank Condor principle, right. Okay. So, what are you here? You have one of the very simple pictures. What you have is you have two states, one is the ground state, which is S0. What does S stand for? S stands for singlet, you can see the electrons are paired, right. Then in the excited state, you also have another singlet which is S1. So, 0 is the ground state, 1 is the excited state, right. And what you will be doing is if the if you would be sending in enough radiation, then the molecule or radiation of the current frequency of the correct frequency, the molecule would absorb and then it will it would make a transition to the upper state. Okay. Now, before going deeper, see there has to be something which determines this, right? Which determines the intensity of your transition, the probability of your transition, and all these things. Okay. Now that's why Frank Condon is so important. Now look at this. Why did I draw a vertical arrow? I could have drawn an arrow which was like this. What is the difference between me drawing a vertical arrow and me drawing a slanted arrow? What happens? No, tell me what happens. I know that. Tell me what is the difference between a vertical transition and a sloping transition. Just refine what you said and tell me what do you mean by vertical transition? What is not changing when you make a vertical transition? R is not changing, right? That is what you said, but I just want to know the answer. R is not changing. If I do a sloping transition, what happens? You can see R is changing, right? Now, Frank Condon said that each and every transition has to be what? Vertical. And why does it have to be vertical? Because as you said, nuclei are much more massive than electrons, right? That is why this is a vertical transition. You cannot have a transition which goes like this. You cannot have a transition which goes like this, right? Second, you look at the two states, S0 and S1. Right. What are these levels? What are these levels? You know these levels. What are these levels? Okay, very good. So these are vibration states, right? So that means in S zero, you are looking at an electronic state along with vibration energy levels. In S one, you are looking at electronic state along with vibration energy levels, right? Now remember, your psi, your total wave function is or should be having electronic component, vibrational component which is the nuclear and there is one more what is that? Rotation. Then in between the vibration energy levels you will also be having what? Rotation. Okay. But we will not worry about rotation that much here. Two principal things you are going to worry about one is electronic and one is vibration. Okay. Second guys, how do you think or tell me 
if you would be drawing this curve okay if you would be drawing this curve how would you draw this curve this is actually a born oppenheimer approximation this curve actually tells you what a born oppenheimer approximation is tell me how would you draw this curve what does born oppenheimer approximation say it says that essentially these two motions are independent of each other the electron moves much faster than the nucleus okay do you remember in born oppenheimer approximation you said something that the electronic wave function has a parametric dependence on the nuclear coordinates do you remember that word parametric dependence see what happens is it's very simple the nuclear also vibrating right okay whether it's in the same state or whether you go to a different state the internuclear distance can change see for example in these two curves the ground equilibrium distance for this one was r e say prime for the excited state it is r e double prime now has the equilibrium internuclear distance changed or not it has changed right because you can see the upper state is shifted slightly to the right as compared to the lower state and because the minimum occurs at what the equilibrium bond distance what you can say is that once you have excited the molecule what has happened the bond length has increased isn't it the bond length has increased tell me a typical situation suppose i give you a molecule which is ethene it has a sigma bond and a pi bond okay it has a certain bond length now we hit it with the radiation where what happens one of the pi electrons goes to into the one orbital from the bonding to the anti bonding molecular orbital if it goes to the anti bonding molecular orbital what happens to the bond order now initially it was 2 now it is now it is 1 right now it is 1 because one of the electrons already in the anti bonding orbital so what has happened the bond order has changed decreased so what will happen to the internuclear distance increase so this is possibly one of those situations right when the internal distance increases right it is one of the cases okay now what does the parametric dependence come from so look at this because the nuclei cannot move as fast as the electrons but remember even when you are making the transition the molecule is still vibrating it is only that you have decoupled these two that means it is called a separation of variables in that sense which you do it in 2d and 3d harmonic oscillators or particle in a boxes so parametric dependence means is what you do is you take a certain r okay you take a certain r and solve the schrodinger equation at that r so you'll be getting since you're solving for psi electronic you'll be getting e electronic that means energy of the electronic state at that value of r okay now again you change r so for example what you are starting is you look at this r this r so this is say r1 r1 at r1 what has happened at r1 there is almost no attractive force between these two that's where it is tailed off now what you are doing is you are keeping the nuclei act fixed at r1 and now you are solving what is showing your equation so you get e electronic right then you you plot e1 out here theek hai now what you do is you change r1 so you go to say r2 once you go to r2 again you solve for e so then say you get e2 and you go on doing that once you go on doing that what will you get right see because you cannot take these two things together the thing that helps you is the electrons are moving much faster than the nucleus so if you are assuming that the nuclear nuclei has changed the electrons are bound to follow that okay so what you are saying is that at i fix the nuclei positions at different rs and then i solve for the electronic energy e electronic and then i plot that once you plot that this is the curve you get and this is your born oppenheimer approximation this plot tells you the born oppenheimer approximation this is how you get it 
Okay, that is a signature of this plot. So born Oppenheimer approximation. That's how you would plot it. And this is called a parametric dependence. That's why you will see, that's why you will see if you're looking at psi total, it is given as psi electronic, then it says R comma R, then psi nuclear or I can write vibration R. So, this is your psi, I will come to this in the next class, but just realize the importance of this. This psi electronic, how many coordinates does it depend upon? What are the two coordinates? One is R, small r and the other one is big R. What is small r? Small r is the distance between the electrons, is in interelectronic distance, right? Or it is the distance of the electron from the nucleus, okay? So, it is the position of the electron. What is big R? Big R is the distance between the nuclei. So, that means your electronic wave function is not only dependent upon the position of the electrons, but what is it also dependent upon? The position of the nuclei. And when you draw a plot like this, this is what you get out of it. Okay? This is essentially what you want Oppenheimer approximation is. Psi vibrational essentially just depends upon the distance between the nuclei. Okay? So, remember each and every plot like this is actually a picture of your born Oppenheimer's approximation, that is how you get it. Okay. So, this is where we start with some of the very essentials of spectroscopy and next class we will go into Frank Condon factor or Frank Condon overlap, that is what determines the intensity of the transition and all this thing.